We've talked about Muhammad adopting pagan practices and somehow they've been Islamic all along. Uh, so it goes back to, to, to Ishmael and so on. Uh, he takes a pagan idol, the, the black stone. He takes their religious practices. All of these are now part of Islam. He takes false stories that we know are false and incorporates them into Islam. This guy just seems to be grabbing things from everywhere Precisely, and yeah. turning them exactly. into Islam. Uh, he also does this with um, historical and legendary figures, right? So, so, so famous people that he's heard about, whether historical or legendary, uh, famous figures from history. For, I mean, for instance, he does this with Jesus, right? Jesus was a Muslim, right? His followers Jesus are Muslims. Was, yeah. His Muhammad followers Moses are Muslims. Muslim. We're just going to yeah. turn everyone into good Muslims. Exactly. How far is he willing to go with this? Yeah, How far is he willing to go when he turns people, historical figures, true or legendary, yeah. into Muslims? Yeah, actually, you'll, you'll see that Muhammad had a tendency to basically take any and every figure of importance, of, of stature, and turn them into a follower of Allah. He does that with Alexander the Great and Aesop. Now, again, if you read the Quran, you're not going to find Alexander mentioned by his Arabic name, Iskander. Iskander is the Arabic form of Alexander. What you're going to find is a reference to someone called Dhul Qarnayn. Mm -hmm. Chapter 18 of the Quran, verses 83 80, uh, to 98. Chapter 18, verses 83 to 98, recounts the story of Dhul Qarnayn, which means the Lord of the Two Horns, or the Two Horn One. Now, it's vitally important to remember that the story of Dhul Qarnayn was composed in response to three questions again that the Jews told the pagans to ask Muhammad to see whether he's a prophet. Three questions. Mm -hmm. This is according to all the commentators. You can consult their commentaries and they'll tell you that Muhammad recounted the story of Dhul Qarnayn as part of his response to three questions that the Jews told the pagans to ask Muhammad to verify whether he was a prophet or not. <clears throat> that means Dhul Qarnayn was well known. If the Jews are asking Muhammad about Dhul Qarnayn, tell, tell him to tell us about Dhul Qarnayn. That means he was a well-known figure. So he wasn't some figure that Muhammad made up. He's taking a figure known to the Jews and the Christians as well as the pagans. And Muhammad is then running with it and including it as part of the Quran. So then who is Dhul Qarnayn? Well, I don't need to answer the question for you. Abdullah Yusuf Ali answers it in an appendix to chapter 18 of the Quran. You go to his appendix to chapter 18. He defines the meaning of Dhul Qarnayn and then he admits that the majority of Muslim scholars identify this figure as Alexander the Great and he himself accepts that this is Alexander the Great. Let me read it. <clears throat> Notice his definitions for the term uh, Dhul Qarnayn. What does that mean? The other three meanings may be applicable as implying Lord of the East and the West, Lord of wide uh, territory of two kingdoms. It can mean that. Lord of two crests on his diad diadem typifying two kingdoms or a rank superior to that of an ordinary king. It can mean that. Lord of more than one epoch, one whose power and influence extend far beyond his lifetime. Now notice what he says. If we accept the popular identification of Dhul Qarnayn with Alexander, all the three latter designations would be applicable to him. Did you catch it? All three definitions apply to him if we accept the fact that this is Alexander the Great. Now he gives some evidence why you should accept it. One is, he is represented on his coins with two horns on his head. He considered himself a son of Jupiter, Amman, who had the two horns of Aram with the divine mission. So notice, there are coins depicting Alexander the Great with two horns. And that's what Dhul Qarnayn means, the Lord of the two horned ones. Now notice this admission. Now the generality of the world of Islam, the generality, not just the mere opinion of one or two obscure Muslims, the generality of the world of Islam have accepted Alexander the Great as the one meant by the epithet Dhul al qarnayn This has been the general opinion of Muslims. Now what does he say? Personally, I have not the least doubt that Dhul qarnayn is meant to be Alexander the Great, the historic Alexander, and not the legendary Alexander that people embellished, of whom more presently. <clears throat> Did you catch it? According to the general Islamic opinion, according to Abdullah Yusuf Ali, according to the people before Muhammad, Dhul Qarnayn was Alexander the Great. Now, can I ask you a question? Does history testify that Alexander the Great was a God-fearing monotheist? Absolutely not. He was a pagan of pagans. So he was a pagan, huh? Mm -hmm. And yet Muhammad turned him into what? Yeah, he's a good Muslim. <laughs> and if all history says otherwise, then all history must be wrong. Precisely. And then what about Aesop? What do we do with Aesop? Mm -hmm. According to chapter 31 of the Quran, 
there's a story about Luqman. I understand the implication of these statements. When the Quran mentions a person that it nowhere uh, goes into detail in explaining his background, that means the Quran is presupposing that the readers already know who this figure is, right? Mm -hmm. Out of nowhere, it mentions a figure called Luqman. Who in the world is Luqman? The Quran doesn't tell us why, because it's assuming the contemporaries of, to the Quran knew who Luqman was. Lo and behold, you can read the Muslim commentators, Mulana mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali, in his commentary. You can even read Abdullah Yusuf Ali, who actually denies identification, but has to admit that this was the traditional view. And even the late Muhammad Assad, all three of them say that traditionally, Islam has identified Luqman as Aesop of Aesop's fable. Why? Because there are Arabic traditions that attributed the same stories found in Aesop's fables to this figure called Luqman. And yet, chapter 31 of the Quran says that Luqman was a Muslim who exhorted his son to follow Tawheed, which is Islamic monotheism, and to avoid shirk. So Aesop of Aesop's fable was a Muslim like Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. And so what we, the pattern we find in the, the Muslim sources is Muhammad is just adopting anything that seems remotely popular during his time as part of his religion and baptizing it, as it were, into his religion of Islam. Every historical figure he can come up with, um, every religious practice he likes, uh, it all becomes part of Islam. And Muslims don't, don't see anything yeah. slightly suspicious about this.